So we're going to give you five categories. We call these the five voices of the birds. Um, now, these are simplified, it's generalized, and, uh, and, somewhat, and there's a, a gradation with some of them. But we're just going to give you these five categories. We're going to talk about each of them. We'll spend more time with some than with others. And, um, and this will kind of give you, these will be the handles that you'll be using to start interpreting what you're hearing. I want to go ahead and name for you real quick what the five voices are. So you have adolescent begging, territorial aggression, companion calling, song, and alarm, right? And so we're telling you, uh, we're, we're going to highlight territorial aggression because it's happening, especially right now as birds are setting up their territories in the spring, you'll see a lot of it. Once it's established in the, you know, in the late summer, in the fall, you don't see as much of it, but you'll see a lot of it in the springtime right now as they're all kind of figuring it out. You know, they're kind of like having these heated conversations about, no, uh, uh that's my berry bush. Like, that berry bush over there is your, this one is mine. And they're, you know, because they, they want to make sure they got enough food for, for, you know, to attract a mate who's going to be like, oh, yeah, nice spot. Yeah, let's make some babies, you know. Um, and so they kind of get into little arguments, but it's important to note that they're not fighting to the death. Like, they're not trying to hurt each other, necessarily. Like, they can't afford an injury. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So it's loud, it's boisterous when you see it, but it's not alarm. But it, it can be alarming when you, you're like, oh my gosh, what's going on over there? But then when you tune in, you're like, oh, okay, it's just those guys are fighting, whatever. I, uh, I, last summer I was teaching at a music camp and we were sitting out playing music in this field and there was a mockingbird that was chasing this robin out of its territory. And so this is an example of, you know, not the same species, but, and the robin would keep coming back, and then the mockingbird would chase it, chase it, and the robin would fly off, and the mockingbird would be, you know, right on its tail, and then the robin would get away. Five minutes later, the robin would come back, boom, and the mockingbird would chase it. And then after a little while, there was this one instance where the robin was flying, the mockingbird was chasing it, and the mockingbird caught it. And they both like went up in the air, straight up in the air, and tussled, and then came down to the ground, and just sat there and looked at each other. <laughs> now what do we do? <laughs> you know, because they weren't trying to hurt each other. So once they caught each other, it was just like, oh, okay, now what? Right. Um, but another thing to know is that you know, outside of you know, birds of another species, their their territories might overlap. Mm -hmm. So you might have. You know, one species sharing uh, a territory with other species and not fighting over territory. So, right, because they have different feeding habits and things like that. They're not comp competing necessarily. Um, so, territorial aggression. Second one, adolescent begging. This is another one that you're going to encounter primarily in um, sp springtime, early summertime, where they've established their territory, they've, and the, and the birds now have a brood of young birds in the nest who are hungry, and so they're begging for food. And uh, I almost felt like I just heard it for a second, but anyways, like, you know, and so they're, the, the, and they'll get to the point where, and maybe some of you who've raised children have noticed this, where for all the world, they kind of look like little adults and yet they're still just, follow, they're literally following their parents around saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. You know, and the parent looks, you know, kind of harried and rushed and is like grabbing bugs and stuffing them in their, stuffing them in their face. Like, okay, here you go, eat, 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 yeah. I don't know if this is it, where they flutter their wings, yeah. like at a feeder, uh -huh. it, that would be a juvenile asking. Possibly, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, right. The food's right in front of their face, right, but, they but they're like, hey, feed me, feed me, feed me. Like they want their, the parent to actually stuff it in their mouth, right? And, and so this happens both on the ground around, you know, where the juveniles are actually following them. But before that, it'll happen in the nest where the juvenile birds are just sitting there calling out, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. And it really sounds 
pretty much like that. They're just saying, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. And it's this incessant, repeated, phonetically not much variation from species to species. They're just like making this kind of annoying sound. Like, feed me, feed me, feed me. And, and so you'll start to hear that and you'll see those behavior. You know, if you see a bird with other birds following it around and, you know, they're kind of annoying, like that's probably what's happening, you know, there is the mama bird is like, okay, like we got to keep feeding these kids, like, okay, come on, let's go get some food and stuffing in their faces. And so, um, yeah, I, I've, I've had friends talk about having encounters where they're like, oh man, what's happening here? Like, it seems like one bird's like kind of harassing the other bird, you know, and then after a while it's like, oh, Oh, okay. I, I see. Oh, that's a juvenile and it's just, okay. Gotcha. It's just feeding the other one. And so that's another one that you'll see a lot and you'll hear it. You know, it's actually a great way to identify where nests are. If you listen, because it's always it, in the nest, it's always in the same spot. That's another way you can tell when you're like, oh, what is that sound? And it's kind of harsh. You know, it's a little, I mean, has anybody here had a crow's nest near their home? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, yeah, yeah, they don't shut up. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, again, whenever we start to get into alarm, like it's important to distinguish, like that's not an alarm. That's just an annoying teenager, basically. <laughs> you know, it can look sound, look and sound different ways, but it tends to be like, especially when they're the, you know, nestlings, it's really high pitched. It's this really high pitched, like, but it's really consistent. It's like the most important aspect of it. It just doesn't. It's relentless. It doesn't stop. And sometimes it can sound like an alarm. It can sound like a bird alarming, but it's it's just a juvenile begging. A story that comes to mind for me is I last spring about a year ago I saw. Um, three red-bellied woodpeckers in an oak tree near my cabin. And I was like, huh, that's odd. I guess I never see three w woodpeckers together, you know. You just see two. I never saw three. And what was interesting is, you know, woodpeckers tend to always be on the trunk of the tree. But there was one of them that was perched on a horizontal branch. And I was like, what is going on there? This is so weird. And they were chasing each other around. They were chasing each other around the tree. And I couldn't understand, like, I was like, is this mating? Like, is this two males trying to court this one female? Why is this, this one red you know, woodpecker perching? Um, and then after a few minutes, I saw one come over and stuff food in the mouth of the one that was perching. And I was like, ah, now I get it. But that's getting into a little bit of behavior rather than sound. And then, of course, there's what most people think of when they think of, think of bird sounds, which is? Song. song. Exactly. Um, songs tend to be lyrical, depending on the bird. They can be really complex and long and ornate. Or with other birds, like the house sparrow, could be barely more than a chip sound. Something like the goldfinch can be really long. and. Um, songs have two main purposes, to attract a mate and to uh, defend their territory, or claim, not defend, more like announce their territory. And the same song is doing both things. So for a bird, one song could be, hey ladies, and at the same time, back off guys. But it's the same song that's having you know, serving both purposes at the same time. One of the things that's really an important takeaway for recognizing a bird's song is understanding what we call baseline. So baseline is when everything is, basically everything but an, an alarm situation. Everything but a life or death situation is what we call baseline. Um, that means the birds are like relatively relaxed. They're not in danger. 
they're going about doing their regular feeding and mating uh, activities. And so song is a really great indication that we are in what's called baseline. So this is one of my favorite things to talk about. Who knows what the dawn chorus is? Only? The dawn chorus. The dawn chorus. Only? I'm here. I'm seeing some head nods. How about raise your hand if you know what the dawn chorus is? Wow, just three of them. Okay. So, remember when I talked about earlier, what's the first thing that... Ah, it's so distracting here. I can't see it. Oh, this is the <laughs> cardinal right there. But it flew in really fast. Um, when I talked about what's the first thing that the birds do in the morning, we all said they sing. Exactly. And when, when do they sing? Dawn, just before the sun comes up. Just before the sun comes up. It's just starting to, to lighten up. And it's actually... Different birds start singing at different times. So when it's still dark out and it's just like just a glimmer of light, you're going to start to hear birds like the robin or the cardinal, and they'll start their song. And with, with some species, they have a special song that they only sing at that time of the day or a variation of their song that they only sing at dawn. And as the other birds start to wake up, they will add their voice to this chorus and it builds and it builds as the sun is getting closer to rising and so you have this little trickle of song and then there's more then there's a few more species and a few more species and a few more species and then eventually it reaches this crescendo of sound of just like you know depending on where you're at i mean you could have 20 30 40 species of birds all singing at the same time and then eventually some of the early birds will kind of start to taper off and then it'll taper back down and become eventually like our normal baseline song behavior. But every morning um, there is this crescendo of singing and it's really heightened in the springtime, like right now. Like this is, we are at the peak of the dawn chorus. And I really encourage you to, to get up early one morning before dawn and you know, wake yourself wide awake, sit up, and just listen to it. Because it's such a beautiful experience and really powerful experience. So the coolest time I ever experienced that was at the beach. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting on the beach before the sun comes up, and the first thing that comes down the beach is a really light breeze. Mm -hmm. And following the breeze, you could hear the birds singing from east to west. You hear the sound mm -hmm. coming, and it goes over you like a wave, and then the light comes. Great, that's just where I was going. So imagine that chorus of sound. And then let's think about what we know about the planet that we live on and how it rotates. So the sun is always rising somewhere on this planet, correct? Are you with me there? I didn't just make that up. So there is sun, there is dawn happening at every moment somewhere on this planet. So at every moment of the day, somewhere on this planet, birds are waking up and singing their, the dawn chorus. Now imagine that wave of song traveling around the planet 24 hours a day. So this song, if we think of it as a collective song that birds sing, this song is happening somewhere on the planet 24 hours a day non-stop, circling the planet. Now, let's add a layer to it. Birds emerged from theropods 150 million years ago. And 66 million, I think it was 66 million years ago, four distinct branches of the bird family emerged. So let's go with that number. 66 million years ago, there were birds on this planet. Let's, let's assume that they were, at that 66 million years mark, that they were singing, that there were songbirds singing. This song has been traveling around our planet 24 hours a day for 66 million years. How's that for a concept? What I found amazing, no matter which bird popped in or whatever was singing, it always worked. You know, it was always harmonious. 
and if you think about an orchestra or you know anybody, any group singing, that everybody would just start, that would never happen. Mm -hmm. And the more you listen, and the more birds joined in, the more amazing it was that there was nothing that was discordant about it. It was beautiful. It was awesome. Another cool aspect of the Don Chorus is that predator birds tend to not hunt during the dawn chorus. So it's almost like a truce, you know, where it's just like, okay, we're going to honor that this, this time of day is important. So why, why do you think they do this? Any guesses? Why do the birds get up and sing the dawn chorus in the morning? Totally. That could be part of it. Is saying, hey, I'm here. Roll call. Roll call. Yep. Yep. I made it. I'm here. Just so you know, I'm still alive. Any other guesses? Gratitude. That's the one I like. That's the one that really resonates with me. Is like, thank you. Thank you for living another day, for making it through another night. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's song. So we've gotten territorial aggression, adolescent begging, song. One more uh, for you, two more, but this one, the one more is uh, companion calling. This is a sweet one because, uh, so this will often happen, you'll often see this between mated pairs of birds. The really classic example is the northern cardinal, you know, and you might, you might even say that it borderlines on codependency with them because they're really, they're always together. Once they've found a mate, they pretty much stick together. Usually the male takes the, the lead across the landscape, you know, checking things out is how I interpret that. Is like making sure it's safe up ahead and then the female's following. And, when the, and, and often this is when birds are feeding. Uh, and so they're, they're in the brush, they're down on the ground, they're picking up insects, and it's almost like tossing a ball back and forth. The, it, there's just like this little, quick, high-pitched, like chip, and then the other bird, chip, and it's just this back and forth, like chip, chip, and it's just this way because they can't necessarily see each other at all times, but you know, they can, uh, they'll just give this little chip and know that the other one's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Are you detecting it? I didn't oh, yeah, it's right there. You didn't just, right oh, there. yeah, okay, yeah. There's the cardinal doing his companion call yeah. right now. Chip. So, yeah, there's two cardinals down here, like below us right now. And uh, they're just going about their business. Hmm? Right, so, so there's different bird species will have slightly different sounds, but generally they're all relatively high-pitched and very quick. And um, this kind of, like, when things, are, when things are relaxed, it's just this kind of back and forth. And there are non-vocal examples of this, actually. And Tohi is, a, is an example of a non-vocal where when they're in the underbrush and they're feeding, they have this feeding pattern where they jump up and scratch. Yeah, like they hop up and scratch the ground and then they see if there's a bug there. And so when the, when the mated pairs are in the brush, they, they kind of take turns. Like scratch, scratch, eat, scratch, scratch, eat. And so they're listening for the scratch. And if the scratch stops, then they become really concerned. You know, and, and I've seen this with the Cardinals before where, uh, you know, you've got the chip, chip back and forth and then the chip stops. The female stops singing. I was outside once and I, and I witnessed this and the, you know, almost a, 
there's a, so they're chipping back and forth, and the male chips, and then the female doesn't chip. The male chips again. Chip, 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 chip. So, you know, starts looking around, chip, chip. Hey, where are you? Like, hops up, starts looking around, chip, 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 chip. Hops up higher, chip, chip, looking around. You know, gets really high on a tree and is like just scanning the whole area. Like, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Like, chip, 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 chip. And then finally, it'd be like a, the female, like, chip, sorry, I was eating a bug. You know, like, <laughs> everything's fine. And like, chip, chip. And, it, you know, he calms back down. And then they drop back into their rhythm of passing this back and forth. And so, yeah, that's like a distinct, a lot of times in the older, in, in, in a lot of field guides, this is actually starting to change, but, um, which I th found fascinating. Somebody showed me a field guide recently, and it was starting, they were actually distinguishing some of the sounds based on the categories that, similar categories to what I'm describing to you. But it used to be that, and it still is true mostly, that in all the field guides, you'll look and there's song is one of the categories of sound that they list, and the other one is call. You know, and so pretty much all the other sounds that we're talking about were just call notes. It's like, and the call note is fill in the blank. A lot of times when they're talking about call notes, they're talking about the companion call. But not always. Like they kind of lump a lot of things into that category. But it's a regular sound that you're going to hear a lot. Uh, and it's not always a sound like uh, dark-eyed juncos, for instance. They will actually, they move in flocks. And they're, they like hide in the shadows. Like they're always, like I've never seen one in broad daylight, you know, like with the sun shining directly on them. They're always, I mean, I remember even seeing one uh, feeding in the road near my house once. And I was like, weird, what's going on? It's in, the, it's in the road. And then I realized that it was feeding in the shadow of my mailbox. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, like <laughs> you will not, you're always in the shadows and anyways they're really dark and they blend in well and I rarely even see them I usually scare them away when I walk up I'm like oh sorry guys I didn't see you there because you're ninjas um, but the, they communicate they have this their companion call is they don't make any sounds when they're feeding but they'll flash their tail feathers and so they're actually communicating because it's a dark tail it's a dark tail but when they open it up right on the edge are these two white feathers so they're like, they'll flash these as signals to each other, like nonverbal companion communications. Any questions about that real so quick? call notes versus the songs. Those were, they were differentiating right. in, the, in the books yes. now. Yeah, so a lot of times if you go to a field guide like uh, Sibley's, for instance, Sibley's Field Guide is a really classic example, and uh, they list all the birds and they'll speak about the bird vocalizations and they usually list song and call. Oh, look at this. We got 50 times per second. <laughs> uh, traditionally, they've been separated into song and call rather than the five separations that we're using. Does that make sense? So field guides don't separate it to the extent that we do. They're not bird language savvy like we are. Yeah, You're ahead of the curve. Under the difference between companion calling and, and singing. Uh-huh, right, right, <coughs> yeah. And so I was just naming that because a lot of times that's the sound they're referring to whenever it says call in a field guide. Um, but, you know, we're kind of taking that call you know, category and parsing it out and being like, actually, there's these, all these other things going on in the call realm. Yeah. Depending on the species, the call could be subdivided even more intensely. Right. You know, it's like some birds can have a different, you know, especially once we get into alarms, which we're getting into soon, um, some species can have a different sound to indicate human, bobcat, coyote, uh, predator bird, you know, so they can have a different sound for each different species and possibly even individuals, you know, like, oh yeah, that's Joe. He gives us bird seed. 
that's Mary. She doesn't, you know. So like they might, they could have a different sound for different individuals. So that's why you know lumping it into just song and call doesn't acknowledge the vast complexity that language really is. Even even lumping it into five categories is just like a sad, <laughs> you know. It's like language as we know is so complex. So we're lumping it into five categories just so we can get a handle, uh, so we can begin to get a handle on just how complex language can be. Pitch, rhythm, and intensity are the three defining factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. I'm going to write that down. Pitch, rhythm, and intensity. Nice. We're taking notes too. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> well, that's all, I don't we have to regulate for meaning, but that's uh -huh. an example right there of how it changes. Yeah. Meaning is totally changed by what you do uh -huh. with any one of those variables. Um, okay, so the four that we've spoken about so far, I'm just I keep naming them because I want to like help you remember. So territorial aggression, adolescent begging, song, and companion call. So these four voices, we broadly categor they, we categorize these as all what we call baseline vocalizations or behaviors, right? And basically, what that means is that if you're hearing these sounds then likely the landscape in general is at, is at a baseline, meaning relatively relaxed. And, you know, that can look like a lot of different things. Like for birds, baseline, you know, within the context of baseline, you've got preening, feeding, uh, bathing, like setting up territories, mating, all these different behaviors, including fighting like arguing with each other, that's still baseline. Because the thing is, is that if a predator shows up suddenly, that fight stops. The territorial aggression ends immediately because suddenly like, they're in the same boat. Like they'll both get eaten if they keep fighting. And so it's like, okay, that's baseline. That's what we do when things are chill. The fifth is when we step out of baseline. The fifth vocalization is alarm. Um, and alarm is, it's a lot of things. Like, so alarm is often graded. So it's not just like sirens going off alarm. You, know, you have everything from mild annoyance to fleeing for your life. Everything in between. Everything from like, hey man, why'd you bump into me? to like, run! <laughs> like both, like, so, so there's a lot in there. But in each case, you've left baseline. Baseline, it's like, okay, yeah, everything's chill, like I can listen to it or not. But then, and that's like this pattern that kind of rolls across the landscape. And then there's this break. And you're like, oh, whoa, what's that? You know, there's, there's something else going on. And, uh, and so there have been moments where I'm like, oh, what's that? And I want to like turn around and look and be like, Which oh, what's going me. on? Yeah. And in fact, <laughs> just a couple minutes ago, I turned around when all the J's were, were going crazy up here. Right. Yeah. And so there's, you know, alarm is, alarm is, they kind of help define each other in that regard because there's, like, it's again about tracking because that's how, that's how tracking animals works. It's like, well, I know what the forest floor looks like generally whenever it's been, when it hasn't been disturbed. And I notice the breaks in that pattern. And that's what tells me something about what's going on. And so baseline is the pattern, is the undisturbed forest floor, and the alarms are the tracks. Like, these are the things where it's like, oh, wait, what's going on? what's happening suddenly and it's um, you know there's a lot to it because it's a sound but it's also this felt experience you know uh, it literally because I'm not necessarily listening like I'm talking to you like we're doing a class and so I'm not necessarily logging in my mind all of the baseline vocalizations that are going on around us at all times but if I hear an alarm it like impacts me. You know, it makes me want to turn around and look. And, uh, 
and that's the that's how you tell the difference. You know, you so alarms you have you have like mild like I'll give you the example of the robin and just ignore Michael <laughs> right now. Just pay attention to me. <laughs> so I'll give you the classic example of the robin and, and maybe you've had this experience. Now, how many people have robins that feed around their home? Like hand, show of hands. Okay, great. This is a good example then. So um, <clears throat> like I've had this happen to me many times. I <clears throat> step out my front door and there in the yard is a robin feeding. And uh, you know, if I was being really conscious about it, maybe I looked out the window first and I was like, oh yeah, there, there's the robin's feeding. Cool. You know, I open up the door, I step out, and the robin stops feeding. You know, he's like, what's going on? You know, he just stops and looks at me. Now, if I stand there, the robin might just, you know, I just wait, like I busy myself with something. It doesn't look like I'm coming out into the yard. Robin might watch me for a moment and then go back to its business. Start feeding again. But if I start walking down the steps into the yard, Robin's, you know, suddenly, not only does he stop feeding, but he turns to, like, get a good look at me. If I keep coming, he actually stands up. He kind of perks his body up. And that's the cue. That's the cue to all the other robins that might be around. Something's going on. Hey, everybody, pay attention. Something's going down. You know. And uh, if I get, if I keep continuing toward the robin, as, like disregarding it, then it might even make a little tut sound. Tut. And if I keep coming, eventually it's going to get irritated. It's going to be. Like, it's going to. And it's going to fly up onto the fence or, or whatever, like just out of reach of where I would be able to get it as I get closer. And so those are like the gradations of alarm, still relatively low. Like it's annoyed. It doesn't, it, you know, it probably recognizes me. It knows I'm probably not going to try to eat it. But it's kind of like, hey, man, I was eating here. You interrupted my meal. What's going on? Come on. Like, aren't you paying attention? And, uh, <clears throat> and so that's distinguished from, uh, from some other variations. Do you want to add anything at this point, Michael? I can just keep going. Well, I just, I love... <laughs> I, what you just said there, the, the question that the robin asks, aren't you paying attention? Like, I just, that's like one of the most important questions that bird language asks us. Aren't you paying attention? Because they are, you know, and it's confusing for them. It's confusing for the robin to have us going about our business doing what? You know, like they don't get it because we're not paying attention. Like we're not paying attention. Every other animal out there is listening to that robin. Whenever it starts, it's tut and makes it sound whenever it suddenly gets frustrated and, duh, 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 and flies up on, on the fence. Like, all the other animals in the area that can hear that go, oh, what's going on over there? It's like, oh, it's that guy coming out in his yard again. Uh-huh. Okay, good. Okay, cool. You know, everybody else is paying attention, but you might not even notice it. You know, it's just a robin. You're like, you've got your, you know, like, I'm busy. I got important stuff to do. Like, I'm on a timeline. I'm heading out to work. Maybe you don't even notice it, but it notices you. And, you know, it's like surprise. It's like, oh, what's going on? And, and so everybody else is listening to that and hearing it. And so it's a, it's a choice whether you hear it too. There's a robin tutting right now. Really? Yeah. Yeah. The birds are really working for us today. <laughs> it's a good spot. Well, see, that's, that's the thing that we're going to get into later with the jays and the crows. It's like, they're confusing. We don't really know what's going on over there. You know, so another example, so that was like the robin example of alarms, uh, kind of going up the scale from annoyed 
headed toward fearing for your life, you've got somewhere in the middle is the, uh, the scolding alarm. So this is what will happen, and it sounds kind of like this. So that sound is the songbirds have spotted a predator. And now they're, and, and they're not necessarily afraid that the predators are going to eat them right now. Like often, it'll be with a cat, say. You know, like cats walking along, and the songbirds, whoever spotted it, will just follow it out of reach in the lowest branches of the trees or what, what have you, just making that sound making sure that everybody else knows like hey the cat is right here it's right here. now it's over here now it's going over here <clears throat> until the cat is out of their territory and so you call that like a scolding sound it's actually the another term for that sound is pishing there's actually a word for it it's called pishing and it's a, an old technique to to actually call in birds like if you want to see a bird, like see a songbird, yeah, you make this scolding sound because if you make that sound and it sounds enough like a bird, then all the other birds want to know what's going on. So they all start coming in. They'd be like, oh, what's going, oh, there's something going on over here. I want to know what's going on. And they, they come to check it out and scold whatever it is too. And uh, yeah, so I don't, so, it kind of, it's a, me, you know, it's a means that humans can actually consciously disrupt baseline. Um, and, it, you know, you can use, like if I was leading a bird walk or something, and I wanted to try to, like, check as many off the list as possible, I might do that to just, like, pull them in. And be like, oh, there you go. There they are. They're, they're all over the place right now. So annoyed, scolding, and then you've got <clears throat> what we call the seat alarm s-e-e-t and this is the sound that many many of the bird species actually share you know when you get down to the lower levels there's all sorts of ways that they express annoyance there's different sounds that they make when they're scolding but when you get up to the most extreme when you get to the cooper's hawk level alarm it's almost across the board seat. And we call it that because it's this really high pitched, sharp, loud call. And it sounds like seat, like seat. And that means run. That means hide. Well, what would be the human equivalent of that? Help. help. Right. Yeah, across, across societal boundaries, we all know what help means. If someone mm -hmm. yells out help, we all know what that means. Yeah. Does, do higher frequencies travel further than lower frequencies? Yeah. It's, yeah. So that's the deal. That's the deal with the seat alarm is that the high frequency sounds actually travel more readily and it's harder to locate the source of the sound. You know, if I thump my foot on the ground, it's like, it's easy to hone in on that. You're like, oh yeah, somebody's out there on the deck stomping their foot. But if you give this seat alarm, it's not as easy to locate exactly where it's at, but you hear it. You know it's going on. Yeah, so go for it. The way wavelengths work is they're, they're like, you know, they're a wave. There's a high point and a low point, and there's a certain distance, you know, with a it takes for a, a, wa a wavelength to get from the low part up to the high part and back to the low part again. And every frequency has a different distance. You know, the length of that time is different. And um, what I've heard as a possibility is that the high frequency that songbirds use when they give that alarm, that really high tss, it's hard for me to even imitate it because it's so high. Um, is the relative length of distance between the two eardrums of a hawk's head. So the idea is a sound comes in from one direction and it hits the first eardrum in the, in the hawk's ears and then 
you makes that wavelength and hits the next eardrum right as the you know the next waves going by so it's basically hitting the two eardrums of a predator bird simultaneously so that the bird's sense of direction is disabled it's the sounds hitting both eardrums at exactly so usually with a sound the way our ears work sound hit, hits one eardrum and then hits the other eardrum and then we go you know it's like a do doom so then you're like oh d direction that way sound comes from this way it goes do doom oh directions that way so the idea is that birds bird alarms evolved to maximize the disorientation directional disorientation of a predator bird and i think that's so cool right because you you know they're basically shouting like hey look out everybody the cooper's hawk is here but they don't necessarily want to in that moment also reveal their personal location and so that's why it is the way it is like it gets out there and nobody knows it's just like okay everybody hide so I have a question between uh, the difference of scolding and how do you fit the seat? Yeah, the seat's um, hard. So in my neighborhood, sometimes a red-shouldered hawk will come in and all the jays will just gather around, you know, making their noises. Now, are they scolding at that point? Because they're obviously very visible, but they're, they're you know, giving the alarm to the whole neighborhood that there's a okay. hawk in the neighborhood yeah. sitting up on that tree somewhere. Would that be more scolding? scolding? So, okay, because they keep coming up, I'll, I'll, I'll promise to do my best to talk about Corvids after lunch because it's like a whole different realm. Yeah, and, it's, and what I'll just, I'll just go ahead and throw in the clause now. We call it the Corvid clause. It's like all of this is true and the Corvid clause, which is essentially like, they're really loud, they're very vocal, they're doing all kinds of stuff. It's interesting to watch them, but these categories we're speaking about don't necessarily directly apply to them. And, may, and you know, hopefully I'll get a chance to share a little bit more about why that is, because they're really cool. But yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we wanna, we, wanna, we wanna give you the foundation before we start, start talking about the, the variations, you know, or the aberrations. Yep, so just a few more minutes before lunch, but um, any last things to say about alarm? Yeah, so I want to I wanna just highlight that, especially, you know, when I was talking about um, getting into bird identification can often be, I find, can be overwhelming for people. And one of the things that makes bird language so accessible is it's an embodied experience. It's all about, like, how does that sound make me feel? Or that's one way of approaching it. The, the way I like to approach it is how does that sound make me feel right now? Like, am I comfortable and at ease in my body or am I really nervous and agitated? And for me, bird alarms make me agitated. I feel them in my body. You know, I know those Jays over there are going crazy and I felt it in my body and it made me uncomfortable and it, it like I couldn't not turn I couldn't ignore it all these birds are singing back here and I'm totally ignoring them but you know the Jays started making all that hullabaloo blue over there and I could not physically ignore it and so that's what I'm looking for I'm looking for that embodied felt experience of how are how are these birds making me feel and how can I interpret that feeling to um, to just explain what their experience is right now so I've had a lot of experiences where um, a bird is doing like especially like cardinals where they have that really intense like you know this alarm that's like just really fast and and I think about how much energy is is being used to make those sounds one of the things we know about animals in the wild they do not waste energy 
energy conservation is of utmost, utmost importance. They don't just like, you know, run around in circles just to get rid of their excess energy like little kids do. You know, like they are, everything is done for a reason. So if a bird is, is expelling that much, expending that much energy to create a sound, it's for a reason. And so when I hear that sound, it makes me like uncomfortable in my body. And it makes me like want to just be like, stop, 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 stop doing that. Stop, 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 stop. You know, I don't say that to the birds, but that's the feeling I have in my body. When they're uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable. And that, to me, is the, the most important tool, or not, I would say that's the easiest tool to utilize when you're starting this bird language journey, is how do I feel? And does the bird feel similarly? Because we could go up into our heads and say, oh yes, I think that's a high intensity alarm sound that indicates the presence of a predator bird. You can go there, or you can just be like, oh man, that bird sounds really intense and scared. And just think of it on an emotional level. And I've found that that pathway works better for me. <laughs>